Anybody ever been here before? Yep. A couple people. Okay, cool. Well, welcome back. Awesome. And the rest of you guys, I'm guessing, are, are uh, new timers, first timers, rookies. Cool. Um, who traveled the furthest to get here today? Illinois. All right, Illinois, that's first. Anybody else? Further west? Pennsylvania. Minnesota, that's a good one. Uh, Pennsylvania. Nice. They got us beat. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you guys? Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, okay, gotcha. Cape Town. Cape Town. Oh. Huh? Woo! She wins. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I always love playing that game because it's one of my favorite parts of being a park ranger is getting to talk to so many different people from so many different places who all come here thinking this place is pretty cool. And I happen to agree. And I'm going to get to tell you a little bit about it today. Uh, my name is Shannon, and I'm originally from Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, I've been here for about two years now. And uh, my hope is that I'm going to uh, spend about 30 minutes with you guys and tell you a little bit about what makes this place so cool. But if at any point you need to leave, you got the, you got the wiggles, need to stretch out those legs a little bit, a little bit on the time crunch, you don't only have so much time. If you start to feel a little hot, starting to get a little lightheaded, please head into the gift shop. It's air conditioned in there. You can get you some Powerade, some water, get some snacks, all kinds of those sorts of things. Please head in there first. Do not sit here and tough it out, all right? Uh, my, your safety is my number one priority. Then, restrooms. Uh, none in the fort, unfortunately. So to hit the restroom, you're going to have to take the long walk back to the visitor center. Trust me, I know it sucks. Uh, and head down that way. Uh, but if at any point you do get up to leave, I promise you it is not because I, uh, it's because I'm boring. Hopefully that's not the case. Uh, but if it is, just walk it off. I won't think ill of you at all. Uh, I'm going to take care of this saw real quick. <laughs> Preservation team, this is Ro. They're not going to hear me. <laughs> that's the funny thing. I would prefer not to run over there. Good. I'm going to stick their boss on them, though. You can hear me. Is it possible to cut this off during this program? We get them both soft. Okay. Amazing. I get, it's less for you guys, it's more for me. I get distracted when I hear it. It drives me crazy. <laughs> Love them. You know, we, all, every single one of these casemates, all these little arch rooms that you would see here in the fort, they all would have had a wood door on them. Uh, now, we cannot possibly have a door on every single one of them, or else this would happen year-round, and that's all they would ever do. <laughs> so, we have enough up to at least give you an idea of what it would have looked like, so they're currently fixing some, some serious rotting that's been happening in two of those doors down there, but super appreciate their work, but focus, yikes. Anyway, all right, to get started today, I want to make you guys think. I know. You're on vacation, you left your brains at home. It's okay, it's not too hard, I promise. But what I want you to think about is your favorite story. It could be a favorite bedtime story that you remember reading as a kid, something that you read your kids or grandkids now. It could be a favorite TV show. It could be a favorite movie series. Maybe it's a favorite book. Could be a novel, could be fiction, nonfiction. Maybe it is a real life person or somebody whose story inspires you. Now, I don't need to know what that story is. That one is White Cat's Ear. Know, and this time, you can feel free to just shout out your answer. I don't know why it's called Cat's Ear. What about your favorite story <laughs> makes it a good one? They disappeared. The, 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 they disappeared. The lost colony. The, oh, okay. It's a mystery. Right? That doesn't have a, uh, a clear ending or a cause or a reason. Mystery. Anybody guys like mystery? Yeah. We like a little mystery. Anybody true crime fans? Okay. A couple true crime fans. Cool. Sweet. Awesome. What else? Inspiring. Oh, inspiring. We do like that uplift in a story that we read or we hear about, right? Something that inspires us, perhaps. Yeah. Gives us those good feels. I like that. What else? 
Leadership. Leadership. Ooh, that's good quality to have in a character for sure. Yes, indeed. Anybody else? Suspense. Suspense. <laughs> we love to be on the edges of our seats, right? Gluttons for punishment we mm. are. And uh, yes, yeah, something that keeps us turning those pages to find out what happens next. Indeed. What else? Funny. Anybody else like humor? Come on. We like humor, right? We like to laugh. We like to escape from our day-to-day -day regular lives, you know? Something a little bit more lighthearted and amidst all this dark. Yeah. What else? Horror. Fiction? Okay, cool. Yeah, you like to kind of escape from the real world a little bit. Yeah, there you go. All right, cool. Little fantasy, little sci-fi. All right, what else over here? Horror. Horror. Anybody yep. else a horror movie fan? Horror story fan? Okay, all right, you know. Sometimes fear can be enjoyable. I don't really understand it, but good for you. <laughs> cool. Anybody else? These are really good. Action. My kind of guy right there. That's why I'm a historian, right? I just love action all the time. And I like nonfiction. I like real stories because they help I sh kind of show us who we are, what our identity is, uh, both as an individual but as a collective, right? Uh, so, yeah, hopefully the action story that I have to tell you today will also include some of the other things that a lot of you guys enjoy in your stories. But... Today, the story of Fort Pulaski is written around you in the bricks. And so just like turning the pages of a really good book that you can't quite put down, these bricks are going to reveal the story of Fort Pulaski's transformation from an enslaved labor camp into a beacon of freedom. But how do we get there? Well, something else all stories have to have in common is they got to start somewhere. So... Fort Pulaski's story begins with the War of 1812. Who are we fighting in the War of 1812? I don't even know. The British. Guys, they come back for round two. They really didn't like it much that we got our independence from them the first time, so they came back. All right? And if I were to describe to you and summarize the War of 1812, it's this. The British Royal Navy, best navy in the world, sailing up and down our coastlines, up and down our rivers, attacking our port cities and our harbors. In fact, in 1814, they burn the White House. They burn the Capitol, our seat of government, Do making a mockery of us. This is an international embarrassment. Can you imagine if that happened today? No way, right? So we need to prevent that from happening again. So when we do narrowly win the War of 1812, we're going to need to make some major changes. So President James Madison is going to install several changes, the most relevant of which to our story today is we are going to build coastal fortifications. In fact, we're going to build a whole lot of them, 42 forts from Maine all the way down along the Atlantic coast of Florida, around the Florida Peninsula, along the Gulf Coast of Texas. We even stick two out in San Francisco Bay. Anybody heard of Alcatraz? <laughs> fort Alcatraz is a sister fort of Fort Pulaski, built as part of what we now know as the third system of fortifications. But I want you to think of this system as like an Apple Update 3.0, okay? Follow me here for a second. You got Apple 1.0, rudimentary forts made out of earth and wood. Not all that great against the weather, time, uh, or the enemy, really. So we need to upgrade to an Apple 2.0 when we get these second system fortifications, also made out of brick and mortar, similar to these, but typically they're in star shapes. But unfortunately, they leave the cannons and the men serving those cannons exposed to enemy fire. They have nothing over their heads or around them. So when we make this Apple Update 3.0 to this third system of fortifications, we are going to build some casemates. And I'm going to talk about more of that in just a moment. They also tend to be more pentagon-shaped, as well as some iterations are hexagonal with six sides. So that's a little bit about third system forts, but all of them are selected to be built on very strategic locations. And that's how we get here to Coxborough Island. Did you know that you're on an island right now? Perhaps you did, perhaps you didn't, but you 
might have noticed that you crossed over the south channel of the Savannah River on your way to get here today. If later on you go up onto that second level and look towards the north, you will see the north channel of the Savannah River. And uh, about a mile and a half this way, there's a really big body of water. Anybody have another? Can I get that? a picture of the loft when it comes back? Yeah, the Atlantic Ocean, right? And then 12 miles up the river this way is the city of Savannah itself. So even if you're not familiar with this area, you can begin to get a sense of how Fort Pulaski is going to be one of the first lines of defense for any foreign navy trying to get from the ocean to attack the city of Savannah because they have to go past this point. Now, as you walked up in here today, did you see all of these arched rooms here? These are called casemates. Each one was designed to have one cannon in it. Now, if you added together all the cannons that would have been placed in these casemates here, as well as on the second level, called the terraplane, you'll see some more gun emplacements up there on top. If you add them all together, first and second level, you're going to get 146 cannons. That's how many this fort was built to have. Does it ever have 146 cannons in it? No, because you might not be aware but our government has always been broke, okay? <laughs> yeah, not a shock to most of us. Uh, so they didn't have enough money to put 146 cannons in this fort, let alone the other 41 that they were building, right? So when they finished building this fort, there's 20. But those 20 cannons have a maximum range of one mile, which is plenty far enough to hit anything in the north channel of the Savannah River, anything in the south channel of the Savannah River and provide a formidable defense for anybody trying to take the city of Savannah by boat. So, a very important thing for Fort Pulaski to have been built after the War of 1812. So, they start building it in 1829. But when I say they, who am I referring to? Who's building the fort? There's two correct answers to this. Yes, that's one. The other one, contrary to popular belief, is not the Confederacy, right? This is a United States fort built specifically by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to defend the United States, all right? At the beginning of the war, ain't nobody got time for that, okay? So this is built by the United States government, but yes, mm -hmm. who is going to be doing the hard, heavy, unskilled labor? They're just looking for caterpillars. will be Black now, I am going to use a different word than slave because I believe, just like in stories, words have power. And if I say slave, well, that is implying that that is all that person is. That is their entire identity. It's just what they were born into in life. It strips them of their humanity and of their personhood. But if I say enslaved, E-N, slave, it is an active noun that is implying it is something being done to that person that they did not have a choice in. And so it restores to them some humanity, some agency, and some personhood. There's more to them than just their lot in life. Does that kind of make a little bit of sense? Yep. Right. So enslaved black men are going to be rented out from their enslavers on rice plantations nearby to come here and work on this fort. But it will be their enslavers that get the $12 per month a check per person and not the enslaved men themselves. Yes, they will be the ones that build the dike and drainage system around the outside of the fort. They will also dig the foundations of this place 70 feet beneath us. They will also dig that eight foot deep moat all the way around the fort and the demi loon, that triangular section with the uh, hilly mounds that you saw on your way in. And they will be stacking all of these bricks. How long does it take him to do? Five years. More. I was trying to estimate 18 well. Eighteen years. All right. <laughs> Eighteen years to build this place. So picture it. For 18 years, you've got enslaved black men out here building a fort that's designed to defend and protect American freedom, but they're not allowed to have it. In fact, many Americans don't believe they are worthy of it, which seems to contradict our founding documents that state that all 
people are created equal, right? We're all men, basically. Or Land that everyone the has the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But did all yet mean all? No. We would need to make some major changes to make sure that those promises that were stated in those founding documents would even begin to be fulfilled. And so that major change will ultimately be the outbreak of America's Civil War. But before we get there, the, the fort is finished in 1847. For the next 13 years, there's not a whole lot going on out here. We're not fighting anybody. Nobody's fighting us. It's pretty quiet. But not so much on the inside of the country. We're at each other's throats. Have been for some time. And we're about to reach a boiling point of separation. And that point is reached in November of 1860. What goes down in November of 1860? Well, did we just wake up one day and South Carolina was like, you know that fort out there? Let's shoot at it. Not quite. Something had to tip everything off. What's the spark that lights the flame? They didn't teach us what that. typically happens in November's election? Huh. Who got elected in 1860? Abraham Lincoln got elected president. When Abraham Lincoln is elected president of the United States, it is perceived as a direct threat by many Southerners who fear that over the course of his administration, white people. he will abolish the institution of slavery, which is the backbone of the South's <laughs> economy and their society. Without it, their world would look incredibly different. So, of course, they want to do whatever it takes to be able to defend their right to own their fellow human beings as property. And they believe that the most effective way to do this is to leave the United States, to secede. And so ultimately, 11 southern states will choose to do this, and every one of them writes in their founding documents, stating their reasons for their secession, that they are seceding to preserve the institution of slavery. We haven't got a chance to read them to do so sometime. Mm -hmm. But, first state to secede, South Carolina, our sister state to the north. Now, when South Carolina secedes, it kicks off an entire crisis that some of you are familiar with at Fort Pulaski's sister fort, Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor. Now that crisis goes on for months, and I don't have time to get into it, but just know this. Georgia, they want to secede too, but they see the drama happening up there at Fort Sumter, and they do not want that drama to happen here at Fort Pulaski. So, before Georgia votes to secede, the Georgia governor will ask the state militia to seize Fort Pulaski. And this is done on January 3rd, 1861. On that day, this becomes a Georgia state fort. Two weeks later, Georgia feels secure enough in their ability to defend themselves that they will then vote to secede. And when that happens, then this fort will transition into becoming a Confederate fort. In here, there will be 385 Confederates, and they got a lot of work to do because they got to prepare this place for war. They know it's only a matter of time before the United States comes to get their fort back. So, that moat that you all saw that was so nice on your way in, it was filled with dirt and sand and mud. They got to dredge it back out again. Then, they need to look to the defenses on the interior of the fort. They need to erect something called blindage. What in the world is that word? Blindage? Well, let me direct your attention to that weird green wall over there that doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. That is an example of blindage. Imagine that placed all the way around the interior of the fort to protect those interior walls from any artillery projectiles that might come over the walls, bounce across this grassy parade ground, and smack up against those interior walls, causing damage. In addition, to prevent the bouncing and rolling of those cannonballs, they would dig trenches across the parade ground. Not trenches for soldiers, but trenches called shot catchers to literally catch the shot and shell and prevent it from bouncing or rolling and causing damage to those walls. Now, you might be able to see, if you look closely, some undulations in the ground from where those trenches 
definitely feel them if you walk across this grassy parade ground after our time together today. So, there's also plenty very rusty cannons in here that they got to take out and bring some new ammunition and cannons in. 46 to be exact. So that's a lot of work. The Confederates going to do it themselves. No. Why would you? Well, you can force an entire population of people to do it for you for free. So they're going to bring in an additional 200 enslaved people in here to do the majority of that work. But they'll also serve at other occupations, such as cooks, blacksmiths, carpenters, laborers, things of this nature. So who's in command of this entire operation? Well, none other than Colonel Charles Olmsted. He is 26 years old, born and raised in the city of Savannah, and is intimately familiar with the importance of holding this fort for the defense of his hometown. He leaves behind an excellent diary account of the 15 months of the Confederate stay here in the fort. And in it, he writes that when the enslaved cooks did not bring to him his food at the appropriate time, at the appropriate temperature, or whatever else might have been wrong with it, he would stop what everyone was doing, gather the garrison around, bring the enslaved cooks out into the parade ground, stretch them out on the band's brass drums, and punish them. Now, we typically associate that form of punishment with plantations, but that is a punishment culture of violence that permeates the entirety of the institution of slavery and was still going on mm. within Fort Pulaski's walls yeah, they won't during anything. the Confederate occupation. But just as I mentioned earlier, change is coming. The United States is coming to get their fort back. How do they do it? Well, in May 1861, the United States Navy shows up out there in the ocean to block off all trade from coming up and down the Savannah River, choking off the Savannah economy. Is that going to come from there? I don't know. Well, in November of 1861, 2,000 United States infantrymen land on Tybee Island, only a mile and a half away, which is plenty close to the Confederates over there to... Well, look over these walls and see those 2,000 United States infantrymen on Tybee the Island. Doing what? Well, a whole lot of this. <laughs> Are you going to attack us? Guess not. Huh. And they do that for five months. What are they doing over there? Having a beach vacation? I doubt it. What are they up to, huh? Fast forward a little bit. February of 1862, second year of American Civil War, the United States build an artillery battery, very small position, on a little island between us and the city of Savannah. But that little battery cuts off all communication and the supply line from the fort to Savannah. The fort is surrounded. The siege of Fort Pulaski begins. The Confederates feel that vice mm -hmm. tightening around the fort. They know something is coming, but they're just not sure what. Until the morning of April 10th, 1862, when a United States lieutenant gets in a rowboat, rows across the South Channel of the Savannah River from Tybee Island, lands here on Toxborough Island. In one hand, he's got a flag of truce. In the other hand, he's got a message from the overall United States commander to Colonel Olmsted here in the fort. And in it is this line. The size, the number, and the caliber of the cannons now surrounding you spells your imminent defeat and the unnecessary effusion of blood should you refuse to surrender the fort. Wow. Well, if you're a Confederate in this fort and you read that message, you gonna surrender the place? Nope. <laughs> I mean, why or why not? What are you thinking? You guys have seen the place. Think it's gonna be a pretty good place to hang out if you're attacked? Yeah. 
like you can't like surrender without trying. It's not good for your. Yeah, um, not good for your side. Yeah, no, not good for morale. Certainly not, guys. These walls vary in thickness between seven and eleven feet. Strong fort. Strong fort. In fact, thought to be the strongest of all forty-two that are built in that third system of fortifications. One of the engineers said that you might as well bombard the Rocky Mountains than bombard Fort Pulaski. Right? You're surrounded by a moat. You're on an island, surrounded by a river. I'm feeling pretty good, right? So then. Olmsted has to make the decision. But let's keep in mind a couple of things. One, he's 26 years old. Two, he's a man. <laughs> uh, I knew that was coming. <laughs> Third, he's looking really close at that line that I just said to you. And he's thinking this. Ooh, the size, the number, and the caliber of the gun. I'm terrified. Because he knows but the kinds of cannons that he's got inside the fort are the same ones that he's got on Tybee Island, right? Smooth bore cannons, meaning that the insides of those cannon barrels are smooth. They fire a projectile that's shaped like this, right? Just your typical cannonball. But is this shape the most aerodynamic object in the world? Nope, because as it travels through the air, it encounters a lot of air resistance, slows it down over time and distance, so, no matter if the cannonball is this size, or it's this size, it doesn't matter. Max range is one mile, right? So, can the cannons inside Fort Pulaski reach the guns on Tybee Island? Nope. No, because how far away is Tybee Island from here that we established? A mile and a half, right? So, can then the cannons on Tybee Island reach Fort Pulaski? Yeah. No. No! Or so he thinks. Here's the plot twist to this story. The United States has with them a newer weapons technology called rifle artillery, meaning that the insides of those cannon barrels, they're not smooth. They're rifles, meaning that there are grooves carved in a spiral motion throughout the board. It does not fire a projectile that's spherical. It fires a projectile that is cylindrical with a conical nose which makes it much more aerodynamic. And thanks to a thin metal ring on the back of these projectiles, upon ignition, the heat forces that ring to expand, forcing its way into those grooves carved in the bore, and induces this projectile to start to spin as it exits the barrel. Picture it this way. If I had a basketball, and I were to just stand here and chest pass it as far as I could, would it go all that far? I mean, I'm no Caitlin Clark, but it's not going to go that far, right? 20 yards on a good day. But if I had a football, it's a different size, it's a different shape, and when I throw it, what do I do to it? It spins, right? It spirals. Exactly right. So can that football go farther than the basketball could? Oh, yeah. And it'll be far more accurate. And that is the difference between smoothbore and rifled artillery. Smooth bore max range, one mile. Rifle max range, five. Mm. Five. So, can the rifled cannons on Tybee Island reach Fort Pulaski now? Oh, yeah. And they're going to let them know it as soon as that United States lieutenant rows back over to Tybee Island, lands there, goes up to the commander and says, Well, Olmstead says he came here to defend the fort, not to surrender it.
on top of wet sand. And doing all of this with orders given by whistle. No light allowed. And just before morning light, they would cover over their work before with camouflage. They make themselves from palmetto branches. So that every day, the Confederates wake up for five months, look over those walls, and they don't see that anything has changed to the landscape. So, when that camouflage comes off, and when that first rifled projectile comes screaming through the air, it impacts Fort Pulaski's walls. It is going to send shockwaves into the hearts of every Confederate defender because, uh-oh, they can reach us. What are we going to do? But then, secondly, shockwaves into the history books. This is the first time in military history that rifled artillery is being used against a brick-and-mortar fortification. It has never been done before. So this is an experiment. Shoot, not even the United States engineers and cannoneers know if it's going to work, but it's certainly a lower-risk operation than, say, attacking the fort by boat, which this fort was built to defend against, if you recall, or storming the place on foot. Anybody want to sign up for that? Didn't think so. Yeah, you saw those defenses on your way in, right? So, it's a lower-risk operation. If it works, great. If it doesn't, oh well. Back to the drawing board. So, the United States will shoot those 36 cannons at Fort Pulaski for 30 straight hours. They will concentrate their fire on the closest corner to those rifled cannons on Tybee Island just a mile and a half away, and it's this corner right here, the southeastern angle of the fort. By the end of the bombardment, those 36 cannons, 10 of which are rifled, will have fired a combined 5,275 rounds. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the, the feel of it? Seen inside this fort, the sound the sight, the smell, the ground shaking beneath you, the walls vibrating with every impact, and every impact taking out whole feet worth of brick falling into the moat. Now so imagine what that by the second day of the bombardment, mm -hmm. there are two 15-foot wide holes in that corner of the fort. Walls that were once seven feet thick no longer exist, which means... There is nothing left to stop those rifled projectiles from entering the inner sanctum of Fort Pulaski. So, if later on today you go up there on that corner, you stand next to that original Confederate Columbia cannon named Zollicoffer, and you look over to where it's pointing, and you see the Tybee Island Bridge, where that touches down on Tybee Island is where those 10 rifled cannons were located. And follow a shot with your eye from that spot over the south channel of the Savannah River, through those holes or just over the top of the wall, across the parade ground, over your head. They're going to start impacting what's in that opposite corner down there. Anybody know what's down there? Yeah, the powder magazine, where the <laughs> Confederates have stored 40,000 pounds of it. So, tell me what would happen. If one of these rifled projectiles, a shell, which is designed to explode on impact, what to do if it explodes in the midst of all that gunpowder? Boom. Boom. Right? And we'd be having this conversation at a much lower elevation, and we'd be celebrating the centennial of Fort Pulaski Crater National Monument. Yeah. All 385 Confederates and the enslaved souls therein would be very dead. Now, Olmsted writes in his report that five impacts hit that outer wall. The fifth one explodes in the doorway, narrowly sending everybody sky high, and he begins to realize the futility of his situation. He takes a look around. Yes, he's got 46 cannons in here. Sure, two of which are actually rifles. But of those 46 cannons, 30 of them are pointed that way. At the ocean. Because that's what this fort was built to defend against, a naval attack. And the United States Navy has been sitting out there since May 1861, and for all he knew, that was a fake-out. And the real attack was coming from there. But that 
that only leaves him with 16 cannons to sprinkle everywhere else, and only 12 actually able to be brought to bear on Tithing Island. And by this point, most of them are buried under piles of rubble. They have jumped off their carriages because they were double loading them, trying to make them reach Tybee Island. And a double load means a double recoil. And they jump off those carriages that they were designed to stop the recoil. So, all of this leads Olmsted at 2 o'clock on April 11th, 1862, to raise a white bed sheet to signal the surrender of Fort Pulaski save the lives of his men. And so on that day, the United States wins the bombardment of Fort Pulaski. They get their fort back, and it will remain in United States hands for the rest of the Civil War. Well, what was it all for? What was the whole point of this, right? Well, I told you at the beginning that that story that I'm telling you now is written in the bricks. And I mean that literally, because if you walk out over those drawbridges later on today, walk around the outside of the fort and look back on the outside walls, you will see huge craters still embedded in the walls. You'll see where the two huge breaches were because the patch brick is a different color than the original brick. So you'll see the full extent of the damage. You'll also see at least six of these still embedded in the walls. And that just goes to show you, rifled artillery works. The experiment paid off. A fort that took 18 years to build was penetrated and surrendered in less than 30 hours. Jeez. So, we ever going to build any more of these forts after the Civil War? Nope. nope. We're going to need an Apple Update 4.0. Uh, but that's a story for another day, known as the end actually see an example of an Endicott battery on our island about a tenth of a mile from where you parked your car called Battery Hambright. So that's a bit about rifled artillery and this shift in technology that happens. But more than that, with every blow at these walls was also a blow at the institution of slavery itself. Because Word will spread like wildfire throughout the intercommunicate or excuse me, the interconnected communication networks of enslaved communities as far north as South Carolina, as far west as the Alabama state line, as far south as Florida. For they learned that if they're willing to risk everything and make it here to the fort, they can get their freedom. So they have a difficult choice. Do they risk the separation of their families? recaptured by slave patrols, encountering venomous snakes, alligators, mosquitoes that carry diseases, potentially drowning in order to make it here to an island. Thousands do risk everything. And ultimately, 2,000 people do make it here to the fort and taste their freedom for the very first time. Right where you're sitting. And so this fort becomes a birthplace of freedom for thousands. And because 2,000 people cannot live here inside this fort, many of them will be put on ships and sent further north along the Underground Railroad Network to freedom. And so this becomes part of that Underground Railroad Network. But just like the rifle artillery, that story being written in the bricks, this story is as well. And that's why I want you to look at the individual bricks inside the fort, because you might see something very powerful. Fingerprints. Fingerprints left behind by the enslaved women and children that made every single one of the 13 million bricks that composed this fort. 13 million bricks made by enslaved hands, stacked by enslaved hands. Now, we don't know their names. We don't know their stories, but they did leave something behind that tells us a bit about their story. And they certainly witnessed the transformation of this fort from an enslaved labor camp into 
a beacon of freedom. So, as you explore the rest of the tour today, I challenge you to think about this. What will you leave behind? What will your story be? And how can your story contribute to the ongoing fight for freedom and equality in this nation and beyond today? And that's all I got for you. Welcome to hang out, ask me some questions if you have any. If you are looking for some fingerprints inside the court, I recommend going into the Northwest Powder Magazine, the very room where the Confederates stored all that gunpowder. It's dark in there, so I have a cell phone flashlight handy. But on all four walls, roughly about head to about rib cage height, you should be able to see some finger indentations left behind in those bricks. But the best place to see them is going to be behind door number 16, in that window, or it's called an embrasure, where the cannon would have fired out, it still bears the scars from the bombardment, removing those top layers of brick to reveal the secrets underneath. You can see it with the naked eye, and there is a sign with arrows showing you where those finger indentations are, including an entire left hand print from a very small child. Now, you are more than welcome to touch them, to take photos of them if you would like to, but it's a great place to just kind of stop and reflect on uh, who put those there, why, and what they witnessed. Okay. Anybody have any questions? Nope. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thanks for hanging out. Thank you so much. Glad you enjoyed it.